Hello and welcome back to theCUBE's coverage here. Day two, all day, bringing you all the action here on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. We've been breaking down all the action for the UN General Assembly Week. It's been Climate Week, of course. It's Media Week with the NYSE Wired Community. Big event going on, a tech talk at lunch tomorrow uh, with Brian Bauman here at the NYSE. Check it out. Uh, Cole Swain, VP of Strategy and Growth, is here with Tomorrow IO. Um, they're doing some amazing work and glad to have you on. Hey, thanks for coming in, Cole. Yeah, Appreciate thanks, John. It. Thanks for having me. So, Climate Week's going on. And um, it's, I'm sure you get this a lot when the word tomorrow in your name because when I say, hey, are you going to come on theCUBE tomorrow? I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, is tomorrow coming on or is yeah, it tomorrow coming it. on theCUBE? Uh, yeah. uh, love the name. Tell, let's set the table. What's the context? What is Tomorrow IO doing? Yeah. And what's the key keys to what you guys are doing, working on? Yeah, Tomorrow's a weather prediction company. Uh, we use AI machine learning techniques to be able to predict what's going to happen next as it relates to weather prediction. And we deploy our own constellation of satellites to create Earth observation of space-based sounder and space-based radar technology, providing the world with uh, global coverage to create observations for inference and training uh, to improve weather prediction globally. Then we package all this up into a predictive analytics platform for hundreds of enterprises and governments worldwide, empowering them to deliver insights that are actionable relative to the context of their operations, helping them build resiliency programs to navigate the impacts that weather's creating for them every day. You know, I want to thank uh, Stephen Orban over at Google Cloud and the team there. I talked to them last Friday. Yeah. He runs a marketplace. I said, hey, I look for some great, good guests to talk about AI. Yeah. Apparently, I wasn't on top of the climate week as much as they were, and they yeah. recommended you come in. I'm so glad because one of the big themes in this shift we're on right now is, is that all these hard problems that were not solvable even a decade ago are now solvable with large scale computing in the cloud. Basically, supercomputing is being democratized right now, as with all the advances we're seeing in silicon and hardware. And then the data problems are now getting solved again. So you're starting to see these hard problems. You're in that category where now you can do things differently with tech. Yeah. So, you know, you're solving hard problems. Yeah. Can you scope the magnitude of, to get a sense of the telemetry of the earth and the world we're living in, atmosphere? I mean, weather is a dynamic data set. And yeah. I can imagine it's always changing. Yeah. Um, scope the um, data challenge and the compute challenge that you have to look at and compare it to what was, how you would have to do it if it was like a few years ago. Yeah. And thanks to the Google Cloud Ready Sustainability folks, Denise Pearl, Jill Higgins for bringing us on board. Uh, appreciate that, shout out. It is a big problem. And you're spot on. It was very different about a decade ago than it is right now. In part, a few categories, right? You mentioned a few. Cloud compute, IoT sensor and device and remote sensing capabilities. AI, which is a big change that's, the whole industry right now is going through a lot of change. As well as the new space frontier, effectively, which allows us to be able to provide our CubeSats in low Earth orbit, that if you were to go back a decade ago, it's just not a possibility. When you think about your point about weather, yeah. it is a big problem. I mean, uh, every corner point around the world, yeah. about 100 to 200 different parameters that you're modeling out. These models are refreshing, in some cases, every three to five minutes, in some cases, every few hours. And at some point, some of these parameters go up to 50,000 feet at altitude. Some go into the depths of soil depth moisture, for instance. So the set, the data, it is massive. And it wouldn't be able to be done without cloud compute, acceleration, and we're using a tremendous amount of different types of technologies like GPUs to be able to run this multiple times to create what's called ensemble forecasting to create risk management solutions for our customers to understand the, the probability of these predictions actually coming out to be true. So it is a huge data set. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the value you can get from just disruption to life, society, business, and then optimizing supply chains to forecasting all kinds of predictive analytics models that may have been based on bad data. I mean, I can imagine huge possibilities, but I want to get the space angle because I think what's interesting is, is that you mentioned the CubeSats. It's been cheaper to launch than ever before to get yeah. satellites up in space. Yeah. So, um, there's congestion and contention for the space. Yeah. Is that a problem that you see, or is that just the way the world is? And does that contribute to more data or more noise? I mean, how would you talk? About, how would you react to that? Because we've been having some conversation in the cube. We don't talk yeah. a lot about satellites, but it is an IoT device. Yeah. It's, it's beyond the edge. It's in space. Yeah. So technically, it's 
in another, <laughs> another <laughs> distributed computing environment. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, if you want to geek out on it, but it's good. It's providing great data. So you got visual data, but also communication data. Yeah. And the sensors that we're putting up there, they're uh, on the radar side. They're the first of their kind in the low Earth orbit, and it's providing a full atmospheric profiling, a full column mm -hmm. of the atmosphere in a way that's really never been provided before. It's it's taking effectively what you would consider a, a photograph or an X-ray into an MRI. And, and the best analogy I can give as to the complexity yeah. of that problem to your question earlier, it's like trying to count the pebbles on a racetrack while driving 200 miles per hour in a race car. Yeah. Hard. And so you have to get all these individual scans and yeah. condense them all into and downlink them to your right downlink stations to then post-process this information into your prediction models, which that in its own right is a complexity that is just one part of the whole space program yeah. from launch to manufacturing and putting these actually into orbit. So it's it's definitely so it's definitely technically fun, technically fun. challenging because yeah. it's fun as challenge is fun for for people like the engineer. But you're getting data and you're actually looking at problem sets that are been hard. Take us through what it's like. I mean, take us through an example of some of the analysis, what the workflow looks like, because this is like mind blowing. Because yeah. now you're seeing things before not just a picture, you're going in and getting deeper layer data that you can compute in real time and then and or just do processing on. Yeah. And never mind getting the AI to come back in to do some assistant as well. Take us through some of the uh, fun examples. The most exciting points were when our pathfinders were up there and you know the company's about around 200 employees at this point. So we just launched, yeah. we're all waiting for the downlink. Yeah. We're, the satellites are setting themselves up slowly, a few days are passing yeah. as we're unfolding them and getting them into position. And all of a sudden we have an overpass over a specific type of storm that we can validate with current radar instruments that are deployed in the US, for instance, had a great parity to make sure that what we're observing is actually correct. Mm -hmm. And our team is bringing it back in and posting it on the Slack channel. And, and we have our first observations, which yeah. that in its own right, now you have a different type of data set that models aren't used to yeah. ingesting. And so now you have to figure out how do you actually bring that into a model to create influence on the prediction. And so it really was just the start of the problem. Yeah. But we had set up all of our engineering and infrastructure in anticipation of that yeah. to make sure that as every additional bird goes up, we're able to improve the predictions over time. I was just talking with Joseph Nelson, he's the co-founder of RoboFlow. They provide developers with computer vision stuff, tooling. And we're talking about the visual value of, of, of the data. If you think about the, vi the visual observation space, yeah. that's a term that uh, we don't use very often, but if you think about like from a data perspective, the observation space, it's everywhere, right? Yeah. So you have, how do you get, it's so much data, one, but then the ability to narrow it down at any given time, to say to find that pebble while you're going 200, you got to do a little matrix move where you slow everything down. I mean, you can do that though yeah. with simulation. So you yeah. got digital twin capability. Yeah. Take us through how you guys think about that because we just wrote an article on The Economist, uh, our CUBE research team around digital twins. It's not just manufacturing. You can create digital twins yeah. and use them to augment analysis. It's almost, it's very much uh, matrix-like. Yeah, it you is. Know, it's like slow it down, you know. It is, <laughs> it's, it's a great like, point. <laughs> I mean, take us Digital through. twins, that's, it's, a, it's a key topic because let's date ourselves back, it had to be about a year and a half ago at this point, uh, Hurricane Otis that hit Acapulco, Mexico. It was the one that rapidly accelerated over a 12 hour period from about 70 miles an hour to about 170 miles per hour. Now there was a Hurricane Hunter mission that flew into that. The same type of sensors that are on those Hurricane Hunters are the same type of sensor that we're putting into low Earth orbit. And what they were able to do was scan the Hurricane and effectively start to understand its current behavior. But what that doesn't give you is what is the expected next behavior. And the United States is the only country that has a Hurricane Hunter program flying off the coast of the Atlantic and off the coast of the Pacific. Yet these types of storms are happening every day around the world. This one got a tremendous amount of attention because it hit a major city, and the National Hurricane Center, for instance, and many of the other global organizations are tracking yeah. these storms around the world, but they don't have the level of fidelity, they don't have the ability to create a full profiled three-dimensional digital twin on a 400 kilometer swath overpass to recreate that in real time, to then understand yeah. what's causing these changes to happen. And that's what's really exciting about what we're yeah. doing is because when we're refreshing, every hour, for every coordinate point around the world, we're collecting a data set that is going to be instrumental to training these AI weather models and for inference on these weather models. And that is just fundamentally yeah. changing the industry as a whole. Yeah, and the reinforced learning will come from additional data you might be getting off your analysis. So, that, exactly. So this is kind of where the tech goes. Again, back to what my original thesis from Dave and I riffing on our CubePod, this is categorically new applications. 
Yes. That's first generation because there are now problems to solve. So we're kind of living in the world where if you're an entrepreneur or you're an engineer, you're like, it's a, you're having a field day here. Right, and I in the mean, age of, of this generative AI, it's changing the industry over the last two years in, in many ways, which used to be very formulaic and a math-based equation to predict what the weather's going to be. Now it's a neural network style. And yeah. it's the convergence of observations and AI together at the same time yeah. that's accelerating a lot of Well, Climate Week is interesting here because I've always been saying, I've been very vocal on theCUBE over the past 15 years. Um, Dave Vellante always rolls his eye because I kind of go on a rant, but sustainability has been kind of a bolt-on, kind of lip service, and I, that's my words, but it's gotten better over the years, but it's been like a white paper, yeah. you know. But I think companies like AWS, like Google, um, and others are serious building in sustainability into the design process. Yeah. So now for the first time, we got the capability to make sustainability stuff, whether it's if you're affecting the environment, whether you're building a data center or working on these big projects, to build in IP yeah. with large scale supercomputing capability in the cloud yeah. to do sustainability. There's no excuse not to, it's like security. Why wouldn't right. you not build it from day one? Yeah. Uh, what's, what's your answer to that? And if you could give navigation guidance to folks about how to make that work better, how do you build some of this kind of big tech? Because you guys are doing large scale big data tech, you're doing large scale big data cloud, doing large scale space. Yeah. I mean, you guys are doing a lot of things. Yeah, there's a lot of pieces. There's a lot of hard parts there. So, yeah. How do you advise a simple organization to build in something that's going to be helpful for the environment? The sustainability category was one we were always put into. And it made a lot of sense because we're doing earth observation, yeah. we're helping many organizations yeah. around the world with our observations to improve their sustainability practices. Yeah. But for us it was always a category that made it a lot of sense, but it didn't make sense in a way because you know we're, we're not driving critical emissions improvements directly through our product. Your, direct imp your indirect impact. You're our, enabling more exactly. impact from others where it started to connect, more recently is this topic of resiliency that's becoming Explain a Explain what you mean by that. Uh, helping organizations be prepared to mitigate disruptions that they would otherwise get slowed down or cause tremendous amount of uh, challenges to their operation by being proactive and being able to get around them with predictions that they're prepared for. And that category of resiliency, it's, it's a, it's, it seems to be a hot topic. Where what, what resilience would it be? Would it be um, physical resilience, workflow, operational resilience. How would you? What would you? It can be. It can all, be all, all of the above. If you were to if you were to think about how do you quantify what climate risk is for a yeah. nation or for an enterprise? It's situational. It's it is, and it depends for, on the, who the customer is. If you're in shipping and you're in supply chain logistics, you will be impacted and disrupted by weather. You will be. So you need to would love to understand modeling around. Hey, let's take the slow route rather than going over the Sierra Mountains. Do you have an action you know? plan? Yeah. Do you have your schedules <laughs> watching it? Do you have all your communication programs in place? Yeah. And do you have the best in class They don't call it Donner Pass for nothing over there in Silicon Valley. I mean, so. they, they had weather predictions they probably would be alive. I mean, that was <laughs> an example, but yeah. this is what, this is disruption. So weather is huge. Yeah. Um, economics, yeah. food. I mean, so weather is, I mean, we've covered this a lot with IBM and the weather when they had the weather company, but yeah. you're, you're getting more technical with it now. You're getting enabled. What are some of the techs that tech um, that you guys have seen that's helped you? Can you talk about some of the uh, advances in cloud and, and compute that's that you guys take advantage of? What are some of the yeah. key Without hardware it, failure uh, fail opportunities? Without it, we wouldn't be able to modularize and deploy models globally and scale them up and experience, excuse me, experiment and sandbox what the best tac techniques and tactics are globally. As well as, again, I keep saying it, but this convergence of AI is, is very helpful because it's key, is it's all about how much you're observing the Earth to train the models. Okay. And that's what's changing how we think about it is the Earth observation we create allows us to run training in high levels of compute and inference to improve predictions for anyone okay. who's building a weather model. Cole, I'm not going to lie, I really like what you guys are doing. It's really kind of exciting. If I was in college right now, I'd be like, I want to work there. Um, this is an area that's going to have a lot of headroom yeah. that you're working on, because it's got a lot of exciting elements to it. You're solving new problems, you're pioneering new territory, you have great impact, mission driven, yeah. checks all the boxes. Yeah. So for the folks watching, what are, they, what are you guys looking for? What's it like to work there? Um, what kind of people do you hire? Yeah. And if someone wants to get involved in 20, uh, into tomorrow.io, what, what do they do? I mean, give us, talk yeah. to the folks out there, give the, give the yeah. plug. Yeah, uh, you got to be ready to immerse yourself in a lot of scientific aspects that you might not already be prepared for. Uh, you got to be resilient, you got to be persistent, you got to be tenacious. Uh, leave the ego at the door. 
uh, be curious and, and really just come in ready to work because that's what we're doing, because we're doing a lot. Uh, we're in space, we're running our own weather prediction models, we're delivering insights and analytics, we're doing all three. Fully vertically integrated solution, driving weather and climate infrastructure and intelligence for the world. And uh, we are the acting National Weather Service for countries around the world that's uh, just a small dollop of the impact that we're able to make. And you're at 100, 200 people you said? Just shy of 200. Just, and, you, and you guys are hiring? Of course. What, any areas in particular you want to shout out to? Uh, engineering? Anything go to market, and <laughs> anything space and anything engineering, we're always looking for top yeah. talent. All right, great, what's next for you guys? What's on the, what's on the business plan? More launches, uh, more customers, and what's really interesting for us is uh, a consultative service of how we work with our clients yeah. and helping them understand the cost of their operations when they're not paying attention to weather yeah. and how we actually put a number behind this because not everybody has a budget for weather intelligence solutions today but they do have budgets for KPIs and weather has a role in improving those KPIs. And AI can give them, you can get them a dashboard to understand kind of what's going on. That's it. Uh, we'll have to follow up and have another conversation on cybersecurity in space, one of my other favorite topics. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you can't do break fix in space either. You can't do break fix in space. <laughs> and uh, how do you manage any kind of malware? I mean, it's That's it. a whole nother level. That's it, man. Cole, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, John. Okay, Cole's here inside the queue. We're breaking. Sometimes I feel like I'm in space with all this action, all this intoxicating tech conversation here on the Cube at the New York Stock Exchange show floor. I'm John Furrier, you're watching the Cube. We'll be back tomorrow for more Media Week with the NYSE Wire Community and the Cube Wire Community coming together. Silicon Valley, New York, bringing all the action to you. Thanks for watching. Yeah.